Good morning. How's everyone today? How many notice it's still winter? <laughs> yeah, we all know where we live. Thrilled you're here today. We're actually going to be just covering some things that are worth giving thanks to God for and celebrating, and some things we're anticipating that God is going to do in our future. And so we're going to begin this morning by looking at one of my very favorite passages in all of Scripture. It's Matthew chapter 16. So when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? And they replied, some say John the Baptist, and others say Elijah, and still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered. If there's one thing you know about, about Simon Peter, he always goes first. And uh, he said, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. And the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. What we learn here is that Jesus has a plan, and his plan is to build a church. He's not just reacting to a moment or attracting an audience. He's building a church. A popular toy is Legos. How many have ever tried them? Yeah. And uh, what's interesting about those toys is they do not come assembled. You actually have to follow the instructions, and you take tiny little pieces, sometimes hundreds and hundreds or even thousands of them, to turn them into something else. There's a design, and you move from a collection of pieces to what it's intended to be by connecting the pieces. This is Calvary Assembly. The first word tells us that what our identity is and our confidence is in is based on what Christ did for us at the cross of Calvary. But it's also assembly. There's some assembly required. We're intentionally moving from a collection of people to a connection of people. That that's where we begin to really see the design that God intends for us. We're a local expression of the church that Jesus plans. And by no means are we the only church. Uh, there are lots of churches in our community and in our nation and in our world that are doing phenomenal jobs. In fact, we're cheering every one of them on. We're honored to be considered one of them. Some people think that uh, 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 churches down the street or in the community are our competition. Aren't you worried about your competition? There's no church in our community that is our competition. It's everything else you can think of to do on a Sunday that is our competition. And so we're, we're grateful. Every time houses of worship are filled with people who are focused on God and discovering what his intention is for their life, we think that's a win. So Jesus has a plan to build a church, and he's building a church where people can develop a personal conviction about who he is. See, popular opinions about Jesus doesn't change anyone. He, he starts out with a question, what's the general consensus and culture about me? But then he moves to this, who do you say? that I am. And Peter blurts out, you're the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus told him that this wasn't just a collection of opinions that, that he kind of consolidated. This insight actually came from his heavenly father. And it's one of the reasons why we invite our friends and family, our co-workers, our neighbors to, be, to join us in worship is because we know technically we can't change anyone's life, but we can create an environment where a connection to God could be made and he can change their lives. So I'm going to be referring a lot today uh, to some information, and you'll find all of it in case you, you don't turn to the page fast enough. It's all here, and it's all in your hand, and, and you can take that home with you. But last year, we know that people who filled out a connection card, 291 first-time guests. They'd never been in our church family before, and they came. How many think that's a really good thing? Yeah, it really is. And 78 people people in 2019 actually made a commitment to Christ saying, we have realized that he's not just a good teacher or a good person, but he's actually the savior of the world. Yeah, I think that's really good. Uh, you might be saying, well, 
haven't we had more people in years past? And the answer is yes. And, and there's a couple things that weigh in on that. First of all is that you probably notice we don't have as many open seats as we used to have in previous days. It's one of the reasons we're in an expansion project so that we can create more seats and more space so that more people can experience the grace of God for themselves. It's also true that in 2019, we actually uh, had less outreach events because our campus isn't safe. There's some things we can't do outside during this construction project. But one of the most astonishing things happened last Sunday. It was unbelievable. It, it, I can't tell you just how powerful it was. But last Sunday in the 9, 30, and 11 services, 39 people made a commitment to Christ. That's unbelievable, isn't it? Absolutely. And so first, first time uh, commitments. We're just thrilled about that. And then worship. Because we don't think that it's, it's enough just to think thoughts about God, but to put the truth of God on our lips. And something happens when we're not just focused on, on proclaiming ourselves to our community, but focused on proclaiming Jesus to our community. That's a really powerful thing. In fact, what I'd like you to see is just for a second here how our worship community thinks about their time together. Hi, I'm Ben Longabaugh, and I'm the worship director here at Calvary. One of the things that we're really excited about is that we've implemented community gatherings as part of our team. Around once every two months, our whole team gets together, we pray, we worship, we laugh, we play games, and it's an amazing time that builds trust and history for us as we go to minister together on Sundays. It's helped me to have confidence outside of the church community because I feel that I belong to a community of people who can worship with me, and that gives me a sort of confidence to like show that love of worship and of God outside in communities that don't normally revolve around those types of values. I think a huge priority for us is that the, when we are leading people into the presence of God, that the people who are doing that have genuine love for each other. The relationships that I have grown through worship team have really changed my life. I've been able to find friendship, mentorship, and also been able to invest in others. Our desire really is not to have transactional ministry, what the volunteers can do for the church or what they can do for me, uh, but relational ministry, where we are a community of creative people. What I hope for our church family is just to see us walk into greater levels of freedom. And freedom across the room looks like a lot of people doing very different things, but you feel it when you're in it. I really started to learn that an outward expression of what God was doing inside was incredibly important to my spiritual development. It's taught me that I can express happiness and I can express joy and positivity and not really be afraid of like people seeing that or like judging me for it. I just know uh, that there's so much fruit to come forward from those times in our church family's life and I look forward to seeing us together walk into that more this year. Can we just express our appreciation to God for those who helped lead us into his presence? Yeah. So uh, this last uh, year, we, as, as always, we track attendance. Uh, you probably have been around here long enough to know that we never make attendance a goal. Our goal is to serve as best we can whoever God brings to this place. But what we know is, is that in a year, I want you to think about this, in a year where we have more limited seats than usual because of our growth, and in a year when our camp has been interrupted by construction, and in a year when we're in a capital campaign raising quite a bit of money for that expansion project, our attendance actually increased 4.2%. I think that's something to thank God for, too. Why is that important? Because it tells me that we're not forgetting what's really important, that this really is about connecting people and Christ together. Jesus' plan is also build, to build a church where people develop a solid confidence, a solid confidence on this rock, I will build my church. And, and so it, Peter says, you're the Messiah, and Jesus says, you know what? You are Peter. Up till then, his name had pretty much been Simon, but he calls him Peter, which means stone, that there's something solid about you, and I'm going to build you on something solid. Until you know who Jesus is, you're always going to struggle with who you are. It's really difficult to, be, to develop confidence in isolation. You can look at yourself in the mirror and tell yourself a lot of things, and it works until you're surrounded by 
a situation that's bigger than you are. But when we become, when we come together, we can actually begin to discover who God has created us to be. People can speak words of encouragement into our lives. We have opportunities to be equipped and to serve others. On this rock, something solid, I will build my church. God wants to do something significant and solid in our lives that increases our capacity. So one of the ways that that happens around here is through volunteers. And, and what you'll notice is last year, 67 people for the very first time said, I'm going to step out of my comfort zone and do something I've never tried or done before to see if God can use that to make a difference. I think that's a really good place to thank God for that because there's a lot of people stepping up. But actually doesn't stop there. We have 410 active volunteers. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to say that again. We have 410 active volunteers. And you might be sitting, yeah. You might be thinking, well, then there's nothing that needs to be done. <laughs> oh, that's not true. But I can tell you this, that that's not the primary reason. This isn't just 410 options to get something done. This is 410 people whose hearts are being activated in the discovery of who they are and what God has called them to do to make a real difference in our world. That's why that number is so significantly important. And so 410. We actually track the volunteer hours at our church family, and almost 21,000 hours was donated by people who were willing to serve. If we paid them minimum wage, which a lot of those tasks, you couldn't pay someone minimum wage and get them done. But if we just paid minimum wage, it's almost a quarter of a million dollars. That's the investment of people who are being activated by the grace of God in this house. I think that is absolutely phenomenal. I really do. Amen. <laughs> Flower City Work Camp is where a lot of our students develop a lot of confidence in their capacity to share faith, to interact with other uh, students, and to develop and to grow in their own confidence. And so last year we had 59 student volunteers and 45 adult volunteers. They take an entire week just to make the name of Jesus famous in the Rochester community and to invest in the lives of people for no other purpose than hoping they get to learn something about Jesus too. It's an amazing thing. And then in life groups, we have 15 life groups, two of which are actually uh, ASL groups. And, and they come together and they share life together and they open their hearts together. And as a result, their confidence is growing. We don't gain confidence by hiding. We gain confidence by getting together and sharing life together. And in fact, uh, uh, I had a, actually had a meeting yesterday for a couple hours with a, another church, and they were asking some of the things that Calvary is doing, and, and, and they had sent in someone secretly to spy on us on a Sunday, <laughs> and we didn't notice, and uh, because we're not looking for that. And they said, you have so many young families and so many young people and so many college and young adult and I said we really do but it would be a mistake to think that that's our only demographic in our church family in fact I'd like you to see this hi I'm Dolores Laraca and um, I've been at Young at Heart for probably the last 12 years and I'm Charlie her husband. I am David Stahl, and yes, I've been, we've been here part about three years. Mm -hmm. And I'm Debbie Stahl, same thing, about three years. I'm Dorothy Reed. I'm Ken Reed, and we are leaders of the Young at Heart ministry here at the church. Young at Heart has, has started traditionally as a luncheon of, of uh, seniors that met at the church, and we've carried on that tradition. And it's also a place where we get to share testimonies have our faith encouraged by those testimonies, share fellowship, as well as pray for one another and for any of the needs that people might bring. I look around and I see people that have lost a child or they've lost a spouse or they've gone through, you know, um, a suicidal depression, which is the case for you. And I was there with you, but uh, you were going through it in a different way than I was. And I think that's encouraging to know people can go through all kinds of stuff in life and Jesus is there with him, with you, just like the song. And you can go, I haven't had to go through that storm yet, but God's been faithful mm -hmm. and he will be. And so that's encouraging to us, um, just to know that you've got people that'll stand with you too. 
Well, we do have Jesus at the center of what we do. But what, what makes us passionate about Young at Heart is the people that come. Yes. Uh, the people give us energy, and it's just so great to see people coming together, sharing, having fellowship, uh, and, and uh, the uh, testimonies that we share. The church is like a family here. And Young at Heart is allowing the seniors to all mm -hmm. get to know each other so we can identify each other and welcome each other, and we don't get lost. It's more than just coming together once a month. It really is the, the uh, uh, relationships that you develop, uh, even getting together with people. And this is a place of, of having those contacts start. Yeah. I am so thrilled that the grace of God doesn't have a height limit, uh, height limit or an age limit. You don't have to wait till you get old enough to experience it, and you don't have to age out of it. It doesn't matter what your age or stage in life, the grace of God is available. And then there's our adventure kids. We have over 115 kids on average every single Sunday in this facility, which is a lot of kids. And they're served really well by amazing volunteers and people who want to invest into their lives. On, on Wednesday evenings, we'll have over 60 kids that gather. And that's not including our student ministry, where there's almost 60 of those who gather. This place is a bumping place with a lot of kids who are developing confidence in who God has called them to be. Please understand this. It is isn't just about a babysitting service because we don't do that. We make an investment into the lives of children and students who are going to walk in paths and they're going to show a world what grace looks like. And we think that's a really good investment. So our student ministry continues. In college, we actually are constantly told in our culture that once you get to college age, you're no longer interested in houses of worship or spiritual things. And what I can tell you is that has not been our experience at all. We are astonished at how interested in and passionate about college age students are when they, when they begin to come around this place. In fact, I'd like to show you something with their group. Hi, my name is John Barca, and I'm the College Ministry Director here at Calvary Assembly of God. Today, we wanted to give you some time to get to know some of our students and also give you an opportunity to hear about their hearts and the reasons why they choose to come to a ministry like Outpost. I think Outpost is like the event. So I do all these other things um, to occupy my time because I enjoy them, but I think doing those things is what brings me to come to Outpost and that's what I really want to prioritize um, because you need to be poured into and have that community. We laugh and cry all within the span of 10 minutes and it's awesome um, and there's no other place like it. For me, um, it's so important to invest in a church community and um, it's become the highlight of my week. It's just a time where I can um, focus on things that really matter. So. It's good to be fed, but I think it's also really important to be able to talk and be able to um, explain what we feel about the Bible and talk about it in that sense. Yeah. Um, so Outpost is just a really cool ministry to be able to just converse about what God's doing in our lives. Every time I've prayed with someone, one of us has ended up in tears. <laughs> I don't know if it's just like the open fellowship, knowing that you yeah. have someone that cares or something, but yeah, it's just really unique and it's like, wow. Not only are we diving into topics about our faith, but we're also in a community where it's not just, oh, we'll talk about this once. We're going to sit and we're going to encourage and be a part of each other's lives while doing that and building each other up and being accountable. Yeah, like you were saying about community, I value the community and I value that time to be able to, um, I don't know, just be with people that are struggling in similar ways. It's important to break away from time in school and get out mm -hmm. and take that necessary rest and that break. Um, when we started, there was like one night every other week and there's only like 10 or 15 people, but now we have 10 or 15 people going to three nights a week. And yeah. so just seeing like all the new people in one place was really encouraging just to see how far it's come. Oh, 
always tell our, our uh, college adults that we feel smarter when you are around here. The average IQ of the room just feels like it goes up. So thank you for that. You know, it takes a lot of confidence to be generous, too. Um, the more afraid you are of your future and the more afraid you are of your limits, the less likely you are to let go of something. There's a lot of generosity that's expressed in very real ways, not just in volunteer hours, but also in terms of releasing financial resources. So I'd like you to just to see this for a minute this morning. This is our financial, by the way, a lot of times in financial reporting, that information goes maybe to staff or to a church board or council or maybe just to church members. We want you all to know what our financial situations are here and what your faithfulness has been able to do. So let's just watch this together. Calvary Assembly, we wanted to give you an update on the financial numbers from 2019 for our church. This year, you were the most generous you have ever been, and it's not even close. In tithes and offerings, you contributed $1,284,886. Compared to 2018, that is a 7.2% increase. This increased in just tithes and offerings alone, while in the midst of a capital campaign for our building project, shows your generosity and your commitment to the work that God is doing here. You gave to benevolence, our building, facilities and registration fees, and we made money from use of interest-bearing accounts. You gave to missions so that not just our neighbors would hear, but the nations would as well. All of these numbers bring our total income to $1,351,926. And that's not even including your giving to Next, but more on that in a moment. Real ministry requires real resources, and your generosity is what fuels reaching our community. Our 2019 annual expenses, not including the building project, were $846,784. Now allow me to break down these expenses. We invested in a facility to gather and worship Jesus. We invested in ministry that changes lives every week of the year, office supplies to help spread the word, and our church was honored to give to missions more than $13,000 above and beyond what was contributed as designated funds. Our payroll includes money invested in our 20 staff who help lead and disciple our church. In addition to this giving, you gave $417,935 to expand our facility. See, you already have a seat, but you are giving so that someone else could come and experience Jesus. Our church spent $1,690,152 on our building expansion in 2019. Because of the wise financial stewardship, utilizing our surplus from the last several years, our church was able to contribute nearly $1.3 million before ever needing to take a draw from our loan from the bank. This means we saved thousands of dollars in interest over the course of the coming years due to the sound financial practices we have utilized. Thank you for all you've given so that people can experience the grace of God for themselves. Yeah. You have trusted us with so much and God has trusted us with so much. And the fact, I, I will tell you, I have never heard of a church that actually increased in their regular tithes and offering giving, general fund giving, while they were in a capital campaign. So many times what people do is they'll take money out of ministry and put it towards facility. And I can't tell you what it means to me to know that you didn't prioritize brick and stone and wood and carpet over people in places who need God's grace. And you went above and beyond. And so in a year of a capital campaign and a construction project, we actually saw an increase in our general fund ties and offerings of 7.2%. That's absolutely phenomenal. And it shows something not only of your heart for what God is doing here, but God's vision and hopes for our future here. Amen? Amen. Amen. So you were, you were very generous. Um, just want to end on this point, is that, that Jesus is building a church where people
become a freeing influence, a freeing influence. Jesus really uses an interesting picture. He says that the gates of hell will not be able to withstand the unrelenting influence of grace. So often we actually see the church as under some kind of pressure from the forces in our world that are seeking to snuff out our light or diminish our influence. And Jesus gives us quite a different picture of what the church is. We're not huddled up behind closed doors trying to withstand the onslaught of ideas that will somehow weaken our resolve. Jesus says that it's the gates of hell that are not going to be able to withstand the unrelenting invasion of grace. That the church presses against gates and hinges and locks and bars that begin to hold people back and keep them from the life that God intended for them. And freedom begins to invade that. We don't just do that in this place. We do that through missions. One of the things that's true is if you give to Calvary Assembly, you're not only giving to ministries here, but we share that with overseas workers around the world. And we're very glad to be able to do that. We see opportunities for things like oil change ministry, where people in our community who are maybe senior citizens or single parents or spouses of those who serve in the military, we think that helping them maintain healthy transportation is in their best interest. And so we actually change their oil. Twice a year we do this. We change oil for anyone who asks and no charge to them. And then there's 240 gifts were given last year because someone's parent was incarcerated and Christmas is going to look quite different, but your grace showed them something very different than what they were expecting. And uh, 47 back backpacks sent to a, a school, people you've never met, but you heard about a need, and so you decided to make a difference. Run to the end, with the thought of little children whose lives would be broken and shortened by human trafficking was not acceptable to us, even though we would never see them in person. And so people who don't walk, walked, and people who don't run, run, and people who don't usually serve, served. And the result is, is that over $20,000 was given to help those precious children have a very different future than anything they could have imagined, but not more. Not more than God imagined. There's hundreds of villages in Ecuador that have been receiving the grace of God. People have gone in and told them about who Jesus is. This isn't an attempt to turn them into a Western culture. It's just to introduce them to who God really is. And in all those villages, they want to raise up a local expression, a church, and, and they don't have leadership. They don't have training. So we heard about the need in the middle of a capital campaign. And they had a piece of property that was available, strategically located to be able to access all these villages. And so we came to our church family and just hoped, just hoped that we would be able to raise $5,000 to help them purchase that property. And when we counted the offering that came in, it was over $13,000. Because the grace of God is for our neighbors and for the nations. For everywhere, everyone, now. Um, you probably are aware we, I'm sorry, I'm a mess today. <laughs> we prayed for a little boy. What he was facing and what he had to go through, I don't even want to start describing it. And, and you prayed, and, and he was able to come home earlier than anybody thought and surprise his family by being home for Christmas. He's been around here on some Sundays. We don't call a lot of attention to him, but if I did, you'd know what a miracle it was. What's happening? The gates of hell are not prevailing against the, against the ongoing influence of grace. I talked to a man yesterday on the phone, really difficult situation, 
beginning of 2019, his wife faced a battle for the second time against a disease that this time she wasn't able to win. They've been attending Calvary Assembly for five years, and he told me every time they rolled onto the campus on a Sunday morning and they got out of her car, out of their car, the first thing she would say is, I'm home. And you say, well, but she wasn't healed. I talked to this woman several times before she relocated. This is what she told me. If, uh, if God heals me, I win. And if God doesn't heal me, I'm in his presence and I win. I can't lose. Do you have any idea what kind of freedom that is to be able to utter those words and mean it? Disease may have invaded her body, but the gates of hell did not prevail. Grace still wins. Our rooms are full, our classrooms are full, and there's a lot of excitement about being in a room that's filled full of people, and I have to tell you, I, have, I feel such an incredible tension when this happens. Such an incredible tension, because I love seeing every seat filled with people who are experiencing God's grace for themselves, but I always worry that we don't have a seat for someone else who needs it. I've seen people pull in the parking lot and then pull back out. I've seen people walk into the lobby, look through the doors, scan the room for a seat when they don't see it. They just go back in their cars and they go. And that's not... I just can't see God saying, if you're full, you're finished. That what God has for the church across the world, for the church and a local community, for you, for your personal lives, that there's always a next step, that God always invites more. That he doesn't just say, he doesn't have a seating capacity. I mean, by law, we have to have one here. But how many are grateful there's no seating capacity limit in heaven? Amen? So, would you stand with me? Two statements. I'd like us to say them all out loud and together. And the first is one of the most grace-filled statements that there can possibly be. Let's just say this together. With God, there is always a next. Would you say that with me again? With God, there's always a next. He's not done with you. And in just in case you are worried about what the next thing might be, let's just say this out loud and together. The best is yet to come. Let's say that again. The best is yet to come. Father, thank you. You have been so good and gracious to us. And as good as you have been, we have every right to expect, not because we're entitled, but because we know of your grace, that you're going to do even greater things in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.